asking us to begin, so we will begin. So, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm really moved to have such a large crowd uh, at the end of the semester when everybody is completely crazy and they have at least five different events on any given night, as I'm sure is the case for everyone tonight as well. Uh, but of course, it's tribute to our speaker, who everyone is so happy to listen to. Uh, so I'm very happy to be able to introduce Karen King tonight for our fifth forum for the study of women and gender in religion. Karen King is Wynn Professor of Ecclesiastical History. Uh, she was appointed to that chair in 2003, uh, and previously she was here as Professor of New Testament Studies and History of Ancient Christianity. Uh, she is trained in comparative religion and historical studies, and she pursues teaching and research specialties in the history of Christianity and women's studies. Her books include uh, The Secret Revelation of John, which she asked me to let you all know is actually on sale at the bookstore <laughs> at the moment. It's already very cheap. <laughs> uh, her books also include The Gospel of Mary of Magdala, Jesus and the First Woman Apostle, and What is Gnosticism? Uh, other publications include Revelation of the Unknowable God, Images of the Feminine in Gnosticism, and Women and Goddess Traditions in Antiquity and Today. So we're really looking forward to your comments tonight, Karen, which are going to reportedly be on some of her latest thinking on what she's excited about now. So <laughs> welcome, Karen King. <laughs> Thank you. I thought this would be a nice small gathering of five or six people, so I'm a little, uh, I thought we'd have a lot of conversation. How long do you want me to talk? Okay, 25 minutes. Okay. Um, what we might do is, is I'll talk a little, we'll, we'll talk a little, and then I'll talk some more, and then we'll talk some more, see how far we get. Um, I chickened out a little bit and thought I would talk to you about some of the previous work I've done before I get to the new stuff, in part because the new material is in a real raw spot. Um, and I thought I would work up my courage by first letting you know that I'd actually done some things. Um, so that when you get to the stuff that's totally a mess, you might not take that as perhaps the absolute norm for um, the way I work. <coughs> when I was a junior scholar just setting out, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah, okay. When I was a junior scholar, uh, just out of a graduate school, setting out with my first job, well-meaning male colleagues advised me to do something a little more central. They said that work on women and heresy would always keep my work at the margins. They said I should work on something like the Gospel of John, something canonical. Fortunately, I was in an environment where not only women's studies was valued professionally, but where, quite frankly, they didn't care about the field of biblical studies that much. Um, as long as I taught my courses in Bible and early Christian history and kept up an active kind of research and publishing schedule, I was free to be as marginal as I liked. I wasn't, of course, working on the material because I thought it was marginal, but because it seemed central to what I needed to be thinking about because there was a kind of urgency about this material. Now my understanding, I think, of what those things were, where that urgency came from, uh, was not something I really understood very much at the beginning, and maybe I can only partially even articulate it now. And it's certainly something that has shifted, that's changed over time with the shifts uh, in my own life, in workplace, in students, and in, in, in just changing. It's fair to say that my first intimations of what these were were largely intuitive, and I think that's still true. This is my setup, by the way, for why my intuitive thoughts about my new project are so frail, okay? <laughs> but there really is the case at the beginning, it seems that there was just more of an intuitive sense that the beginnings were frail and somewhat insubstantial, kind of flickering uh, light and then shadow, if you will. As an undergraduate, I was first exposed to the Nakamati text in a seminar on Gnosticism. I won't tell you how long ago that was, um, but the te Nakamati texts were a set of literature um, 
papyri that were discovered in 1945. Uh, we think that they were hidden in a clay jar by local monks of the Pacomian Monastery to keep them from being burned. Uh, they, the actual texts themselves, the physical manuscripts, the papyri date to uh, the fourth century. They were probably hidden in the fifth. Um, but these are translations from the Greek uh, into Coptic of earlier texts. And we are agreed as in scholarship in dating those texts to the second and third centuries. Now where and how much and how early and so forth, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of discussion about. In addition, there was an earlier discovery in 1896, um, somewhere in the same area of Middle Egypt called the Berlin Codex, uh, in which was inscribed the Gospel of Mary among, an, uh, among a number of other works. Um, there have been other discoveries before this, and there have been more discoveries since it. Um, I suspect you may have heard a little bit of something about the Gospel of Judas, you know, lately. Okay. Um, there was also another text, the Gospel of the Savior, that was discovered actually in the Berlin Museum. There's all just a, they have just cartons of this stuff, you know, and the, the conservator just sort of reaches in a jar, pulls out something, you know, and <laughs> fixes it. And when he has a, a kind of, you know, cardboard box kind of half full of this stuff, he he calls in somebody who can read it, and they go through it, and you know, oh yeah, you know, tax receipt, laundry list, oh, Gospel of Thomas, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know so on and so forth. So <clears throat> that was how the Gospel of the Savior uh, was recovered. So there's a lot of this material, um, and it's and we're finding uh, new material all the time. So in that sense, of course, it's extremely exciting, and I think part of the attraction is, you know, ooh, nobody's ever read this stuff before. You know, uh, what is it? What does it say? And so forth. But I felt a very intense attraction to some of this work. Although I said, as I said, I wouldn't really have been able to say why at the time. But I was told, at the same time that I felt this attraction to these texts, I was told that they were heresy. And so I went on to study them because I felt I needed to find out why I was drawn to what was wrong as a way to understand what was wrong with me and to figure out how to fix it. Now, as I intuited at this time, dealing with these texts would be a process of transformation. It just turned out that the transformation was not quite the one I had envisioned. Um, as some of you may read my work, uh, no. Um, I want to uh, perhaps read you some of the pieces that were most attractive to me, um, just as a way, I mean, we could, there's actually a lot of them. I had a hard time sort of making a, a smallish kind of, of selection. But um, the shortest one, perhaps, is just a few lines from the from a work called the Tripartite Tractate. Isn't that lovely? OK. You could tell that's the scholarly name. Yeah. OK. Um, anyway, what it says is that the father of the all, in his labor for those who exist, sowed into human thoughts that they might seek God. In other words, God created humanity in order to seek. This is what we are about, is to seek God, and God set that within us. This is the goal and the purpose of creation. Um, it's over here. I've got to read my own translation. Another one of these texts comes from... Um, the Secret Revelation of John. This is a more extensive uh, kind of quote. This is talking about um, the world creator. Uh, in this text, the God of Genesis, the world creator, is actually um, a jealous God, uh, one who is not all-knowing. He had to ask Adam and Eve where they were. Um, uh, he walks in the garden in the cool of the day. He's a very uh, aesthete, I suppose you might say, although he's theriomorphic in form. Uh, and he basically is trying to rule over a humanity that is superior to him. And this is one of the ways in which he does it. And this is the response um, that is given by Pranoia, who is the great mother of the all. This is a text which has a trinity, but a trinity not of father, mother, and son, who, a trinity not of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, <laughs> but a trinity of Father, Mother, and Son, okay? And this is the Mother who is the Savior who sends him. She's called the Pranoia of the All. 
So this lower God, the creator God of Genesis, created a plan with his powers, and he sent his angels to the daughters of men so that they might take some of them for themselves, and they might raise up a seed to be a respite for them. Uh, those of you who know Genesis very well will recognize here that, uh, um, that alluring but very strange passage in Genesis 6 where the giants of old take the daughters of men. Okay. And at first, they were not successful. Yes, one for women. Okay. Uh, I'm editorializing. Okay. Um, but when they did not succeed, they gathered together again and made another plan, and they created a despicable spirit in the likeness of the spirit that had descended, the true spirit, so that through it they might pollute souls. And the angels changed their own likenesses into the likeness of each one's mate, filling them with the spirit of darkness, which they mixed with them and with wickedness. And they brought gold, silver, a gift, copper, and iron, and metal, and every sort of things belonging to that kind of stuff. And they beguiled the human beings who had followed them into great troubles by leading them astray into much error. They grew old without having enjoyment. They died without having found any truth and without having known the God of truth. And thus the whole creation became enslaved forever from the foundation of the world until now. And they took women, they begot children out of darkness according to the likeness of the spirit. And their hearts became closed by the hardening of hardening and hardened by the hardening of the despicable spirit until now. Therefore I, the perfect pranoia of the all changed into my seed. For I existed from the first, traveling on every road. For I am the wealth of light. I am the remembrance of the fullness. And I traveled into the vastness of the dark. And I persevered until I entered into the midst of their prison. And the foundations of chaos quaked. And I hid myself from them because of their evil. And they did not recognize me. Again, I returned for a second time, and I traveled. I came forth into those who belong to the light, which is I, the remembrance of the pranoia. And I entered into the midst of the dark and the inside of Hades, seeking to put my household in order. And the foundations of chaos quake, such that it seemed they would fall down upon those who dwell into chaos and destroy them. So again, I fled up to my luminous root, so that they would not be destroyed before the time was right. Still, for a third time, I who am the light that exists in the light, and the remembrance of the pranoia, I traveled in order to enter into the midst of the darkness in the inside of Hades. I filled my countenance with the light of the consummation of their eon, and I entered into the midst of their prison, which is the prison of the body. And I said, whoever hears, arise from your lethargic sleep, and he wept, shedding tears, heavy tears he wiped from himself. And he said, who, who is calling my name? And from where does this hope come to me, who am dwelling here in the fetters of the prison? And I said, I am the pranoia of the pure light. I am the thought of the virginal spirit, the one who raises you to a place of honor. Arise. Remember, you are the one who heard. Follow your root which is I, the compassionate. And fortify yourself against these angels of poverty and demons of chaos and all those who would ensnare you. And be watchful of the lethargic sleep in the garments of the inside of Hades. So I raised him up and sealed him with the light of the water with five seals so that death would have no power over him from this day on. And finally, a short passage from the Gospel of Truth. When the light had spoken through the Savior's mouth, as well as his voice which gave birth to life, he gave them thought and understanding and mercy and salvation and the powerful spirit from the infiniteness and the sweetness of the Father. And having made punishments and tortures cease, for it was they which were leading astray from his face some who were in need of mercy who were in error and in bonds. He both destroyed them with power and he confounded them with knowledge. He became a way for those who were gone astray and knowledge for those who were ignorant, a discovery for those who were searching and a support for those who were wavering, immaculateness for those who were defiled. 
So you say, say then from the heart that you are the perfect day and in you dwells the light that does not fail. Speak the truth with those who search for it and knowledge to those who have committed sin in their error. Make firm the root of those who have stumbled and stretch out your hands to those who are ill. Feed those who are hungry and give repose to those who are weary and raise up those who wish to rise and awaken those who sleep. For you, you are the understanding that is drawn forth. And if strength acts this way, it becomes even stronger. So be concerned with yourselves. Don't be concerned with other things that you've already rejected. Don't return to what you have vomited to eat it. And don't be moths. Don't be worms, for you've already cast that off. Don't become a dwelling place for the devil because you have destroyed him. And don't try to strengthen those who are obstacles to you who are collapsing, as though you could be a support for them. So you do the will of the Father, for you are from him. And so forth. There's a lot of other good stuff, okay? But, but, but some of these things are very interesting. I started working on the Gospel of Mary almost as an accident. Um, I had a colleague from the Jesus Seminar who was putting together a, a set of all, of all the Gospels. You may have seen those. And they neglected to put the Gospel of Mary in. So I did my little feminist thing, being the only woman there. Um, and they said, fine, if you do it, we'll put it in. You have three weeks. Um, so, <coughs> so I started working on that text as well. Now, the larger context for me and my work has and still involves is really, and this is now getting into the work that I'm, that I'm really uh, doing now, is situating these works within the history of the first century of Christianity. Now, what does that mean? Um, early on when these texts were discovered, as, as I think many of you know, uh, they were called, oh, examples of Gnosticism. They were examples of heresies that had been rejected. We already knew about them. So now we just would know more about them. So the story remains the same, only you can just draw a fuller picture of these errors that some of these folks um, had. But what's happening, I think, is that we need to rethink the entire master narrative of Christian origins. We need to rethink the way that story has been told almost from the ground up. And in doing so, that's involved several kinds of prior steps. The, the, the thing is, it's, it's extremely difficult to get out of a pattern that one knows for it so well and that seems so obviously the way things are. You know, when we've been used to reading them in this pattern, we've got it all set, with it all, it all works, it fits, etc. And so there have to be analytic ways to get at that. And women's studies and feminist work, um, work on race and other kinds of things, have let us see ways of coming at things from the margins, from the sides, from underneath, and so forth. Um, and heresy is a really, it turns out, an incredibly interesting way to start getting at Christianity, the Christianity that's come down to us, precisely because uh, it, it, um, it confounds expectations. Um, Christians aren't supposed to think like that. Uh, Christians aren't supposed to have notions about reincarnation. Oops. You know, Christians are supposed to uh, think that the God who created the world is the good guy. Oops. You know? Uh, so on and so forth. It just goes on and on and on. And there are one, you know, the, the way that the secret revelation of John tells the Genesis story, for example, you know, by making the creator of the world a lower god, you know, making the true god the god above, um, leads one immediately to think, oh well, that's wrong. <laughs> you know, that's a wrong reading of the text. But the more you get into it, the more it makes one see things that otherwise get ignored. Why would a good God want to condemn all of humanity forever for eating a piece of fruit? Why would God want them to keep the knowledge of good and evil from people? So on and so forth. And, and it, it raises these kinds of things. So, so students I've had and, and people who read these books and read these texts say that, okay, they're not buying it, but they'll never read Genesis, the Gospel of John, Paul, and so forth the same way again. 
And so it's starting to begin to get at what is that, what is that we're at. Now I think that analyzing and critiquing the discourse of self and other in the whole notions of Christian uh, discourses of orthodoxy and heresy, Christian discourses whereby the other is defined, the invention, if you will, uh, not only of paganism, but of what I call a usable Judaism, um, is fundamental to the creation, to the identity formation of, of early Christianity. So by getting at these strategies that are used, um, that are always used both to, to exclude from inside those who claim to be us and, and make them seem like they're outsiders, okay, and also to draw lines between self and other, especially in cases where they're not so clear, um, you know, where there's a lot of overlap, um, or in cases where that has a, a lot of usefulness, um, I think are extremely important not only in helping us understand the dynamics of the formation of early Christianity and the materials out of which it was wrought, the kinds of issues, the arguments, the things that were at stake. But it turns out that those, that kind of discourse, because of the importance of Christianity in the West, turns out to be fundamental, I think, still to the way that we think about difference and we think about self and others and the kinds of strategies one uses in making those, um, in making those kinds of uh, moves. And we can talk about that uh, if we would like to. But that discourse, it was important to analyze the early Christian discourse, not only in the context of how it, how it was working in the early centuries, um, but also in context uh, in the last century or two, such as uh, Protestant anti-Catholicism, Christian anti-Judaism, colonialism, and so forth. The question then is, what would it take then to tell the, Christian, the history of Christianity otherwise? Um, the second step then was to was after kind of taking apart this discourse or trying to look at it and look at what and what is there and the way in which I think much of contemporary scholarship reproduces the polemics and the dynamics um, of early Christian uh, orthodoxy and heresy is to look at particular texts and say, well, what difference would it make in reading them? You know, how would, how is it going to come out different if you understand this? And that's what I've tried to do with the Gospel of Mary and now with the secret revelation of John. Um, they illustrate how they don't fit into the old mold. I mean, who among you would want to go down in history only by the description of your worst enemies? Um, you know, and it isn't that they won't tell things that are entirely untrue, but they'll have a particular take on it, okay? Um, and I think part of what that does is it obscures sometimes what was at stake and what the real issues were. Um, for example, I think with the secret revelation of John uh, and Irenaeus, who was one of his main, Irenaeus was one of the main people who wrote against uh, texts like the secret uh, revelation of John and so forth, um, was that the secret revelation of John is criticizing Irenaeus' theology. He's criticizing his view that a good God would want the death of his followers in martyrdom, that a good God would want the death of his son, that a good God, you know, wants people to die, you know, um, and so on and so forth, that a good God would issue punishments and so forth. And what the secret revelation of John does is, is, is to, to have a God who is perfectly, purely good and a creator God who is wicked, so that, so that you can use, in this, what the secret revelation of John does is it, it portrays the, the world of God, the upper world, as the ideal, as the utopian, as what is perfect. And then it portrays the lower world as a place where the powers of ruling and order and judgment and piety are wrong. And so, in other words, the dualism there is used not so much for a kind of nihilism or a hatred of the body and the world as it is an incredibly biting critique of unjust power relations in the world below. You know, and now Irenaeus is also doing some critique, but, but they're doing it differently. And as soon as we, we put them side by side in real conversation with each other, all of a sudden the secret revelation of John doesn't seem stupid anymore or impious. 
it seems we can begin to see how Christians were struggling. And this, this is true for Irenaeus as well, with, with these fundamental issues about justice and goodness and salvation and the human condition and what is the role of the body. And, so, you know, and, and now you're into it. Um, and one can begin to, to start saying, oh, I'm glad we got Irenaeus, but now one knows maybe a little bit more why you know, and what the other options were and what kind of critique um, then was in the tradition. The exciting moments um, are always finding the unexpected. And for women's studies, uh, those have been really, 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 really fun. Um, the the uh, story of Eve's daughter, Norea, you know, as the, the mother and the savior of all humanity. Isn't that nice? Um, uh, we could do a lot more with the gender symbolism in that text. Um, the Gospel of Mary, uh, again, which understands leadership to be based not on the kind of body one has, and indeed not on anything that can be written on the body, but on one's capacity to preach the gospel. And because this text sees the body as not the self, okay, that means that one has to see past those things which are written on bodies that are bound to pass away to the spiritual quality of someone and their capacity, therefore, to preach the gospel. Um, and then in the secret revelation of John, I had, I had this um, really fun epiphany where I found out what Christian good sex looks like. Um, it was like, you know, these folks are supposed to be so dualistic, they reject the body, the body is not the self, the body is destined for destruction, the, you know, rowdy, rowdy. They, they hate, heretics hate the body. You know, even when they're doing, you know, ascetic practices like we do, they're doing it, their motive is hatred, you know. We're doing it for good reasons. Okay, but same, same practices are identical. Okay, these guys hate the body. So here we come, trotting along in the in the secret book of John. I had to rewrite half the book. Okay, because I had assumed, like everybody else, this is an ascetic text. Sex is going to come out looking pretty bad. Okay, and there are some bad scenes. Um, the world rulers do things like rape Eve. Okay, and they produce children like Cain and Abel, who kill each other, and you know not the kids you want, okay? Um, but then what the text goes on and it says is that now because they failed, the world rulers have failed yet again, okay, um, to, to, to trap humanity, they put sexual desire, um, and it's a little confused where, but, but, but into them, in hopes that when Adam and Eve reproduce sexually, they will produce counterfeit copies of their bodies into which they can install the counterfeit despicable spirit. Remember the passage I read to you earlier? Hardening their hearts, sadness, that's forever and ever, right? But what happens is that when Adam looks at Eve, he recognizes his spiritual essence in her. And in doing that, they have sex, okay, because they produce a child in the likeness of the true human above, in the Christ image above, the image in which humanity was created, the image of God in which humanity was created. And this then becomes the line of humanity, all created in the image of God, but after this. So what the text is actually doing is it's suggesting that bad sex looks like rape. It's domination. It is, it is uh, the desire to control, to profit, and so on and so forth. But good sex is modeled after the way that God's plenitude is produced. Because this text says that in the beginning you have the one, the, you know, the father, the, you sometimes they call it father, the one, that's a primary deity, who gazes at himself in the light water or at itself in the light water and out of that self-reflection and self-understanding produces the mother who then produces the son and all beings sort of roll out from her. So what Adam is doing in looking at Eve and seeing himself, the true essence, the spiritual essence, and then being productive means that Adam and Eve are producing the same way that the father did. What's I think most poignant about this is that this happens after Eve has been raped. The message of the text is that nothing, nothing that the world rulers can do, no violation that they can do can possibly overcome 
okay, the image, the pure image in which one is created, which remains untarnished and pure and true. Um, and so this, uh, so that's cool. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to do uh, uh, five more minutes. Okay, I'm already over my 20. Okay. Um, then we can, you know, have, I have poetry and stuff. Okay, never mind. Okay. Um, so, what next? Okay. Um, in trying to, to write, uh, think about, and this, this, this is part of the question, how then would one write the history of Christianity otherwise? Okay. Um, and I've been thinking about um, uh, a couple of ways. One would be to try to, to, to tell, do it with a framework of identity formation. You know, that is to say, to take uh, the dynamics of, of self and other as central. You know, what this would have do is allow the other, the alternative, the lost women and heretics and so forth, not just a marginal presence, but a formative one in the story. Um, another kind of, of mode I've been thinking about is writing the story of the problem Christians were dealing with and how those shifted and how the, the definitions of them shifted, you know, at different times and places and how they worked on them. And so what I did was I, I started out by making a list of the issues that Christians were, early Christians were working on. And then I looked at them and I looked at them again and I thought, gosh, those are the same ones we're working on now. <laughs> and that led to two kinds of things. I mean, there were things like the religious identity in the context of pluralism, the nature of evil and justice, the meaning of suffering, the desire for healing, the roles of women and men, slaves and other subalterns, how to interpret scripture and understand its authority, the nature of the body and sexuality, what do the teachings of Jesus mean, how we understand his death and resurrection, blah, 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 okay? Um, so in, in, in doing that, I think there's, there's two kinds of, of things going on there. One, one might say, is that, oh, those, a lot of those are perennial problems, right? Good and evil, healing, suffering, sounds pretty human to me. But I think that what we need to do um, is to look at the way, again, that because Christianity has had such a strong heritage, some of those issues that feel like they're just human might be specifically Christian and Christianity inflected, right? You know, and so getting at getting at those kinds of things partly by having other voices and alternatives, but also not to just assume. Um, it's, it's like when people started working on the body and they thought, okay, that's what we all have in common. O only, oops, <laughs> you know, we've yet to figure out what a body is, okay, because they're so um, culturally constructed and different. Okay, so I thought, okay, well, I can't do them all, so I'll just do the body. Okay, that was a problem. Uh, first of all, if you do the body, you have to do all of them. I mean, there's, there's, oh, oh, I can do evil and suffering without doing the body? Oh, maybe not. Um, disease and healing? Well, maybe not that one either. Roles of women's? Oh, no, I've got to do the body. Do you know what I mean? The body sort of... Okay, so I, I got a grant. I went off. I wrote three chapters. I thought they were okay, but I wasn't excited about them. Um, I got a standing ovation when I did one, but I think that's because I read this really cool poem at the end by somebody yeah. else. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really great poem. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so I think they were still, you know, they were like off to, okay. Okay, then I had cancer surgery, okay? And I went back afterwards, the recently actually, and, and the proposal I had written, quote, I'm specifically not focusing the book on the physical body, a topic of much recent discussion in the academy, but upon what it means to be human. Okay, that sentence no longer made any sense to me at all. It just ceased to be a meaningful sentence. Um, it's so problematic on so many levels, I can't kind of even begin. And I gotta tell you, it made a lot of sense to me six months ago. Um, so the problem is, uh, how can you discuss what it means to be human without the body? How does one begin to get at the endlessly shifting social, ethical, political, psychological, medical, sexual, enigmatic, terrifying, sensual pleasures of bodies? Remember, this is gonna be a little book, okay? <laughs> Um, what do I really want to know? What is this book really supposed to be about? You know, um, and what do I have to contribute? You know, 
especially there's so much great writing out there now about issues about the body and sexuality and so forth, not to mention um, poetry and art and film and so forth. Um, so here's what, I'm, here's what I'm thinking. So here's some first thoughts. These are like totally first thoughts. Okay, don't write them down, don't remember them. <laughs> Think about them. Um, I thought I'd start up, I started off with Jonathan Z. Smith's notion, map is not territory. How many of you know that essay of his? Um, you might want to read it. I mean, one of the points that he makes is that, um, is that if you were to make a map that was actually perfectly a map of a territory, it would be the territory. You know, it would have to be the same size, it would have to have every little up and down, it would have to have every detail. So maps are always selective, and that means maps always distort. But they distort for a reason. It's an intellectual distortion for a purpose, you know, to do certain kinds of work. So he thinks of maps as good things, okay? Um, and, and the word distort is not, is not a negative thing because that has to do with intellectual activity and purpose of all. Okay. <clears throat> but to be human is always to already be mapped. Um, if you look at medical descriptions of surgery, if you take a surgical report and read it, they're trying really hard to be territorial. That is to say, they talk about this particular body and no other. They talk about it in a very mechanistic kind of way. They cut, they drill, they screw, okay? I mean, you know, <laughs> um, like little screws, okay? The scale is one to one. You know, we cut 3.4 centimeters, went 1.2, we cut through, you know? I mean, you read these reports, you know, and they try to be really territorial. Now, obviously, they're also being selective, but, but the point is the territory, and it raises the question about where is the self? Where is the me? You read, you know, you, you know, you read these things and you wonder, where's the person here, you know? Um, a person is the body's territory, of course, but that territory has a history. It's, it's embedded in social relationships. It's in a culture which has formed it to be uh, an American or a Japanese person or of a particular class, to be of a particular gender and sexuality. Now, granted, not perfectly, <laughs> okay, there's lots of slippage, but you, but you know what I mean, it's a culturally formed body. So. The medical mechanistic territory excludes this thoroughly bodily particular self. The history of the self is embodied and fully social. And of course, the social, uh, like gender performances, uh, gestures, standing, speaking, so on and so forth, are ex selves. We have to think about a self as extending beyond the borders of the skin to the social and to the environmental, because you're not a person out of the, those extensions. Ourselves. It requires, finally, of course, getting rid of mind-body dualisms, okay, where you have body on the one side and mind, or you have soul or spirit or something, some kind of location of self that's non-territorial, so to speak. Um, those kinds of notions, I think, in contemporary sorts of thinking uh, have to go. And here, a person who's been incredibly useful for me is the sociologist Theodor Shatsky. Um, who is not well read and, and maybe because he's a really horrible writer. You know? <laughs> and you know how awful it is to read bad writing? But it's worth, it's worth sort of slugging through. Um, but he really talks about the, the procedures whereby the, the, the self uh, is, is, is socialized. Now, constructivism, of course, makes the map seem like it's the real truth. But at the same time, it makes it seem maps seem to us to be culturally relative, you know, whether it's the breath of God infused onto molded clay or it's cultural values written onto the body or whatever. While the territory sometimes gets put off as the true, real, uninterpreted self, you know, the kind of just thereness. Um, essentialism, of course, appeals to that kind of stability of bare territoriality, but of course, in fact, the bare territory is hugely unstable, <laughs> constantly changing, maturing, growing older, gaining weight, losing weight, getting wrinkles, so on and so forth. And all those lovely anatomical drawings that you see in medical books 
are really like who are they? <laughs> you know, like nobody has that perfect body, etc. Um, and of course, that means that even medicine has its maps, and we might want to talk about that because it seems to me that medical mappings are doing something about the ideally functioning body from which illness, deformity, and so forth is deviation. All bodies are deviations in that model. And I want to say, much like the resurrection body. And here I want to bring back in the connection of the, the, the theological. Um, do we see in these kinds of mappings, these kinds of contemporary understandings, the moral connection? Um, Irenaeus, for example, used the experience that all of us have of less than perfect body as a sign of sin so that the body itself communicates the truth of that theology and it's experienced it's, and it's embodied completely. The portrait of the body often, I think, in Christianity is really a matter of absenting, of erasing, hiding, or denying embodiedness when embodiedness is understood as, as instability. The resurrection body for Tertullian, for example, doesn't need to eat, it doesn't make love, it doesn't change, it doesn't grow old, it doesn't get ill, it doesn't suffer, it doesn't die. It not only resists change, its immortality consists in becoming unchanging. In the transformation to a spiritual body, I would argue, it ceases to be flesh. They call it flesh, but what kind of flesh is this? Not, not my flesh, not the kind of flesh I've been living in lately. Okay. <laughs> this is a resurrection bodies walk through walls and do all kinds of stuff. But Christians are also using this notion of the instability of the human body precisely to imagine the possibility of transformation. You know, Ignatius talks about his death as a martyr as being bread that's chewed, you know, the Eucharistic bread that is chewed and transformed. Um, and we see this kind of language of bodily transformation all over the place. The body always speaks the truth, but whose truth? What truth? Contests over whose truth the bodies speak are all over the place in antiquity, and I think all over the place today. Who gets to say, you know, what is the essential true nature of sexuality? You know, um, when does life begin? You know, I mean, all of these kinds of issues. Why are issues about sexuality and food so fundamentally in American society and politics right now the fundamental issues of values? Well, if one goes back to early Christian theology, those are intensely the sites about which Christians were working out issues about sin and salvation, about death and immortality, about healing and suffering, about identity and purity and spirituality and so forth. And I think we're still doing that, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff I've been thinking about. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> So now all ideas you have for the new book, you may begin now. <laughs> you laugh, I'm taking notes. <laughs> I'll say, oh, and thanks so much to the group of people who met, you know. Um, this is very, you know, me up here, you know, you're there. I'm, I'm really hoping this would be a discussion uh, as much as possible. So fe please feel free to talk to and with each other as the conversation moves on, even if we're not Physically, bodily, our bodies are not arranged to facilitate that kind of thing necessarily. But, um, yes. Um, this is all very interesting to me, and I think to a lot of us here. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see this work relating to kind of more mainstream Christian communities or evangelical Christian communities. I mean, the main churches that you see, the people who. Um, maybe aren't as many here at Harvard Divinity School. Is there a way that this connects to their understanding of Christianity, or is this more an academic, maybe liberal, Episcopalian type of discussion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm an Episcopalian, okay. Uh, I, I hope, you know, one always hopes, you know, that the discussion is broad. But what does that take? I think it takes, as much as we can, the best of what the Academy gives us. 
the capacity to read in the original languages, to look at the text, to discuss them, you know, to know the history. In other words, to do all of that exegetical kinds of historical thinking and critiquing, to look at the, at the rhetorical you know, analysis of these texts, of what's going on there. All the stuff we do that, quite frankly, probably nobody out there is interested in reading. Okay? <laughs> but the question becomes, are the issues that the questions and the things we're asking and talking about are those things that are of interest? Um, and I think the answer there is hugely yes. And I think that if one, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, of who one regards respectfully as a conversation partner, I think, whether that conversation happens. And if one is willing always to learn, you know, and to be corrected and to engage and so forth. So, so part of it has to do with with the conversationality and the genre and talking. But insofar as we're talking about, you know, these fundamental kinds of issues in Christian theology, life and death, salvation, good and evil, sexuality and so forth, um, it's hard not to believe that, for me not to believe that people would want to be engaged. The question is, you know, what does that conversation look like? Um, and yes, one goes into a conversation, I think, in order to persuade you know, um, I'm hoping to write a book that will be readable. Um, you know, so I think all those pieces, um, all those pieces are important. It's not a very good answer, but it's more an answer to the genre question. That is a question, by the way, that's been coming up a lot this year in this forum. And I'm, I've been thinking about it a lot. It's a certain anxiety about what we do in the academy and a fear that what we do is very isolated and insulated and we're just talking to ourselves. And um, it was actually in this room a couple of times ago where I started to want to think about that did we, do we have to get trapped in that problem? Because I think that's a kind of a trap sometimes that we get into because another way of thinking and I was struck by the way that you began your talk tonight, which I think I heard you say something like I myself said, I gave a talk myself two days ago, and when I said that the starting point was my delight and my interest in the material and my excitement about it, which I think that's what you said or something like that to begin with. And that one way of understanding what we do in the academy is that we are in fact, reflecting what is already there on the ground. So we are doing the kind of careful articulation of stuff that's already there. In other words, to see ourselves in a kind of cultural, historical way as in fact the product of the culture. We don't necessarily have to bear the responsibility of creating knowledge, but that in fact what we're doing is articulating what's, what's already desired to be told. And we know that because we're following the guidance of our own instincts. Yeah. And of course, if we manage to say it well, as you say, and to say it accessibly, then it can get fed back into and rehash and, and bring the conversation further. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure that we always have to be so worried that what we're doing is just, you know, just limited to our own inside the walls of the academy. Well, I, um, I actually now that you're, you're, you're pressing me much more to, to. to to think as I ought, I think, um, especially in this form, but always, you know, in feminist mode, which is to say that uh, we were talking about this with regard to Emily Culpepper's um, visit before. You know, what, one of the things she taught me is that is that I couldn't do it all. You know, I couldn't be a, 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 an academic writer and an activist and somebody who is you know, painting and somebody who is, you know, doing work abroad and stuff. You know, I can't do it all. But the importance of being in coalition and in in face-to-face -face communication and contact and work with people who are. So it's also the co communities to whom we're responsible. You know, not communities necessarily we want to convert or change. But who are the people in the communities to whom we're responsible? And who are the women to whom we're responsible? And, of course, the model of that kind of work is, is Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza's work, you know, a work that is at the highest level of, of, of academic achievement, but at the same time, um, she speaks to women all over the world, and they speak back to her, <laughs> you know. And 
it's that conversation uh, that becomes important. It's knowing more. So again, I back to my conversation model, but it, but it, it's a conversation model that has to do with who are the communities, the people that we that we belong to or are in our touch with that makes it, you know, makes our work not just academic. Because I think there is a trap. There was, you know, I, I think I see people fall into this trap of in the academy. You know, it's like it's every every sphere is its game. You can play the church game, right? And want to get to the top, have a bigger church, you know, have more people get a bigger salary, have a, you know, be more famous. You can play the academic game, you know, get to be a professor at Harvard, publish more, you know, get to be, you, you know, or are there other things that matter? Are those the communities? Are those the, the games we want to play? Or is there something else, you know, other things? And I think mostly there are other things, but do we forget that? Do we get drawn aside from them? you know, from those fundamental crucial issues. Lots of people are working with and for and inside the context of their churches, and that's, you know, synagogues and other institutions, and that's uh, an important context. But every context needs an outside voice hammering away at it, too. That's my original sin notion for the evening. <laughs> yeah. oh, do you want to talk? This is what I was wondering, because as... Okay, taking con uh, contemporary conversation partners seriously. For example, just thinking of research that's done around here, there are contemporary Catholic communities where the lives of saints, miracles, disruptions of the natural order are taken seriously. Pentecostal communities are taken very seriously at Harvard and School, where healings are a matter of growth. I'm wondering, when we choose this discourse about the body, how much of this is an academic discourse where we limit conversation partners? Because when we talk about texts, um, for example, discussion of the body is something that's within a conflict with these early Christian texts. But discussion of the supernatural, the angels interacting with the world, is really an undercurrent of agreement. I would, at least I would hope I would not read too much in there. I'm wondering, isn't that also a dissentering discourse? And one that also speaks to contemporary peoples when we talk about like, the nature of miracles? whether this is a real phenomenon. I'm just wondering then, doesn't that also add something? I'm wondering if this would be a question that would help you limit who are or are not our conversation partners in the contemporary world. Oh, in the contemporary world? Yeah. You know, I'm just thinking, for example, Mama Lola's come to Harvard and speaks, and she's a, yeah. she's a person yeah. who takes the existence of spirits in the spirit world very seriously, where there's multiple non-human intelligences with their own agendas interacting with us. That's contemporary conversation partners. There was a quote. I don't know how many people of you, how many of you saw the New York Times magazine yesterday. What was the what was the article called? I'm thinking of. He was he was um, he was putting forth Reinhold Niebuhr mm -hmm. as the model for the left, mm -hmm. and he had a quote from Niebuhr in the in the in the article in which he said, "Open mindedness is not is, doesn't doesn't mean you you don't believe anything, and that every, anything goes. Open mindedness means." attention to the possibility that you might be wrong, <laughs> that someone else might have something to add or to give. And I think in a case like, like of those that you raised, it's, you know, one doesn't move easily from where one is, but there's always holding open that possibility that, that this reality that others have, what is that about? You know, that one might learn if one, if one paid attention but at the same time, um, I think it's, you know, that all those things are about, as you say, shared agreements, you know, um, uh, the kind of world we live in. I'm not quite getting at Others may respond better to this point. Or I'm not even getting at what you were trying to. Yes. Several comments. I don't know where to start. You know, for starters, last week on. Can, can, can everybody hear her? Yeah, could you oh, please sorry. Talk um, well, for starters, I'm very excited by your work, Karen. I love your work. And I think that your feminist biblical interpretation is quite powerful, uh, particularly your feminist reading of Gnostic texts and then your use of Gnostic texts to look at Christian, early Christianity. It's very powerful. For example, your, your reading of Gnosticism, um, the Gnostic cosmology as a critique of world power relations. I think that's brilliant. And it's an unusual reading of Gnostic text, and it's kind of a feminist. That's one yeah. example. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to stand up and make compliments? <laughs> 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 I'm 
<laughs> well, you know, I thought I had found all the feminist loopholes in Gnosticism, and I have. This is this is great stuff. And the Gospel of Mary um, as a model of leadership, not based on body, but on she who knew the all knowledge, gnosis. And then this critique of bodies. Um, Hitting the Gnostic view of, of bodies versus the Christian resurrection view helps to deconstruct the kinds of power relations that about the body that have arisen out of Christian early Christian thought. And that's extremely powerful, the notion that disease or illness is a deviation or a manifestation of the quality of our spirit. And using the Gnostic text to critique that is, is just brilliant. I'm, I'm really in awe. I'm sitting over here on the edge of my seat, so I... Those are three examples, but I think the feminist reading that you're doing of the Gnostic text is really important, and then the way you're using the Gnostic text against the early Christian. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate um, your remarks. It, it, it gives me the opportunity to, to say a couple of things that that doesn't always come out in my work. I think I, whatever I'm teaching, I usually put it on and get excited about. You know, sometimes I've taught and the janitors got by. I think they they thought I was a you know like a raving Southern preacher or something. You know, um, but. I think one of the most important things about going after these t- these texts is not so much to um, uh, I'm trying to undermine the way in which they get divided into lines of orthodoxy and heresy for the moment, not not to not to say oh everything is equally of value, let alone these are of more value, but to try to get at what was at stake? What were the arguments about? What were these were people were thinking with these things? How is the way that they're thinking about these things useful for us to complexify the ways we think about them, complexify the voices that we hear in the tradition? And to do that, I think that the thing that if, if someone asked me what I was sort of evangelically committed to, it would be to a kind of critical appropriation that every text, Every tradition, everything has to be looked at, both not only just to appropriate, but to go after critically. And so if one looks, for example, at the Gospel of Mary, one of the things about that text is you could argue, for example, that we gain women's leadership, but at the cost of the body. Because it argues that you can see her body doesn't count. In other words, it's not as a woman that she exercises leadership. That's irrelevant. It's not as a man one exercises leadership, you know. In other words, it doesn't matter what kind of body you have, that doesn't matter. It's this inner spiritual core. Well, at one level, okay, that's great because, you know. Um, but on the other hand, what does this erasure, you know, of sexuality mean for the appropriation by contemporary feminists, for example? You know, what does, you know, the, the secret revelation of John has this, has this notion, I, I would say, of good sex, okay? <laughs> but, you know, did I neglect to mention that this good sex that happens is without desire? <laughs> okay, the fun part's gone, okay? <laughs> now, you know, and this, again, you know, is not necessarily, you know, some, it's something we'd want to think about, okay? The appropriation. And it actually... So I can't, sometimes I think somebody who knows Augustine better than I do about the way it kind of fits Augustine's notion that the, the original Adam created in the garden before, before the whole fruit thing, okay, um, could procreate without desire, you know? He could raise his penis the same way he could raise his arm. I'm raising my arm, now I'm not desiring anything particular. I just, you know, willing it to go up and down, you know. Um, and, and so there's that, that sensibility again. It's not the kind of sexuality necessarily won't. So, there's, so I tend in some ways, I think, to present what's positive about these texts in a kind of American root for the underdog kind of moment, you know. But, there's, but, the, but the object is not to vilify the, the canon or the tradition we have, I've already alluded to the fact that I think, you know, notions about original sin are something we need to think about, okay, um, in terms of the sense of fallibility and humility and other kinds of, of ways in which that tradition has come down to us. But at the same time, that has to be read critically as well because we know some of the ways in which that has been harmful, hurtful, and so forth. So, stuff like that. Um, I have a you can sit only if everybody in the back can hear you. 
part of the problem with the nine commodity texts is because you just found them in these jars, we've never been able to socially locate them. Right? I mean, well, a jar is a location. <laughs> right. It's right. Not but it's very really soft. difficult to figure out, um, to, to put a geography, a date, um, you know, other things with them. And I was wondering if this work on the body gets you closer to social location, to people, and to. Um, so much of the work on these texts is focused on them as in the history of ideas, yeah. as intellectual history. And um, because, because it's been so difficult to extract any kind of social location for them, and so um, is the body sort of a way to get at that form, or do you see that as... Uh, I think that the... Um I, I tried at the beginning of the Secret Revelation of John to give as much social context as I could. You know, what can you tell, for example, about the jar that would tell you where it came from, who made it? What What does it tell you about about the the, the script? You know, about scribes and about writing and processes of doing that. About the papyri, the cartonnage from the. Um, from some of the leather covers contains uh, in it receipts and things that take us, uh, that two of those codices definitely locate themselves in the Pacomian monasteries in terms of, in terms of the, the cartonnage um, and construction of the codices. So we can put them there, we can talk about them being read, but then they were translated, three separate translations from Greek into Coptic. What does that tell us about a shift from Greek speakers to Coptic speakers you know, in the second and third centuries in Egypt? Um, so there's, there's lots of there's some social information, you know, that you can squeeze out of the things themselves. But I think the content of the, of the text, people have tried to place these and say, oh, they're, they're done by elites. No, you know, those kinds of things. Well, you know, um, you can do that with Christian texts, too. You can, you can, you know, talk about, you know, um, elite school settings and not and so on and so forth. But they, they, they tend to crumble and fall a little bit, at least, you know, um, in that regard, I think that a text like the Gospel of Mary shows much less of that elite kind of setting than a text like the Secret Revelation of John, which clearly belongs to a very literate kind of school setting. Okay, um, so we have multiple locations for these for these texts. I think, as we would posit for the New Testament Gospels, what do we know about them? Uh, again, almost nothing. You know, about where they were written, who wrote them, even even at the beginning, much about how they were used. Now, later we can talk. We can say a lot more about those kinds of things. So I think that basically what we end up doing with these texts is intellectual history. But hopefully it's intellectual history in a new key. That's to say it's no longer um, the it's no longer intellectual history on the origins to development along a clear linear focus. It's no longer the um, you know m models of, of, of degeneration or of perfection, you know. I mean, in other words, those kinds of plottings where we can see things much more in a new historicist mode is sort of apparatic, you know. Um, and you know, we try to put, I put some of these texts in conversation with each other. They may never have been in conversation with each other, you know. Nobody in antiquity may have known those to put them in conversation. So in some place, we're playing with them, we're creating conversations, you know, with these texts for us to think with, um, as much as anybody did in the past. So I think it's the kind, the way one does intellectual history in a way. I, I've not read the article you mentioned by Jonathan C. Smith, but I find the idea of mapping very appealing um, as you have presented it. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk about that a little more. Um, when I think of a, of a map, just mentally, I, I think of something very flat. Or when I read a map, I don't see where it accounts for the mountains and valleys and curves and so forth. So I'd, I'd like to know if you could probably talk to us how maps as you use them, or mapping as you use it, accounts for those mountains and valleys that aren't apparent when you read a flat map. I, I think one of his points is that is that some maps don't account for them. You know, that any mapping already has things that aren't there. It's selected. If it's a road map, it's, you know, then it's going to have the interstates big and a little, you know. If it's a hiking map, it'll have something else. You know, if it's a if it's a oil survey for a geological survey for oil, it'll have something else. You know, if if um, 
I mean, you've seen topo maps, right, where they try to represent two-dimensionally the three-dimensional. You count the little lines, so you find out how far you have to hike up. Just because it's that far, doesn't you know? It might be four miles up. You know, I mean, so I mean, different maps give one different kinds of information. The analogy is to is to thinking about um, any given way that that we socially uh, use. Okay, the various kinds of ways that the body is mapped in our society. Um, all, all kinds of information. I mean, I, I, I often use the, uh, the kind of a model of intertextuality, you know, that we think with what's around us. But it isn't just that. It's that we, have a, we embody this stuff, you know. It's there. We use it. Uh, and we engage with it all the time. And yet one has to always realize, I think the mapping metaphor lets us realize that it's always partial. You know, one of the examples I often use is to, um, I was an exchange student when I was in high school in Norway. And I was talking to this woman, and I would move a little closer, and she would back up, and I'd move a little closer, and she'd back up, until I finally backed her up against the wall, and she went, stop! And, was, <laughs> and we had this discussion, and we realized that the distance you stand from somebody is different. You know, and I don't remember learning that, you know? And I couldn't help but think, oh, I keep, people always tell me, oh, Scandinavians are so cold. I thought, oh, God, they're the nicest people, you know? I just love them. And part of it is that they want to stand further away, and that feels cold. Do, do you know what I mean? So it comes with it comes with an emotion, it comes with a social setup. And we learn these, we embody them, we do them without even thinking about it until we confront something else. Now, that's a very simple kind of, of example. Um, but it would hold as true for notions about, about the performance of sexuality and sexual roles. It would hold as true for, you know, you know why, you know, I will never, I, you, could, you could have, you know, put me in Japan 20 years ago and one learns. So how you start to get it, kind of, but you never really become an expert that way, you know, in all those ways. The longer one does, it's like living with ancient texts, too. I think the longer one spends with them with the language, the better you get at it, but you know you're always missing stuff. And without the bodies there, we're missing a lot. I don't know if that answers your question somewhat. So it's more, map is more of an analogy to, again, to do certain things, to point out certain kinds of things, and, and then obviously there are other kinds of things it doesn't help us with. Thanks. Thanks for coming to speak with us tonight. Um, I had a question about something, a point you had raised <coughs> earlier in your talk uh, about how um, some of the texts you work on uh, make us rethink um, particular issues like theodicy, uh, for example. And you talked a little bit about uh, the secret revelation of John and how um, some, of, some of the things that, uh, bad things that happen seem to get um, shifted to this this lower creator God, and on the one hand, that seems a bit shocking for, for us, uh, for, for people who know Genesis. On the other hand, it doesn't sound, you know, perhaps that radically different than blaming, you know, uh, misfortune on some kind of lesser divine being, you know, and, and in more, say, traditional uh, Christian understandings, that often is the devil. And so I, I'd like to ask you, do you feel like in the text that you're working on right now that there are um, uh, s solutions to the problem of theodicy that are um, in some ways uh, perhaps um, better than in, in a traditional cr Christian understanding? And what are some of the limitations with, with these texts and their view of this issue? Yeah, I mean, what a, uh, I want to say three things. First of all, I want to say, you know, bringing the point you brought out really nicely is that, is that the territory of similarity amongst these texts almost almost always gets um, passed over or not seen. So, for example, the way in which uh, th the notion that a fallen god rules the world is very similar to certain apocalyptic notions that Satan is in charge. You know? I mean, if you sort of, again, if you do a cosmology of, of something like um, uh, Origen and then sort of Irenaeus and Augustine and the secret revelation of John, there's a lot of similarity. And so the differences become poignant, but they stand out in kinds of ways that one wants to say, what differences do the difference make? But, but one has to start with seeing the similarities before one can even move. So a lot of these systems, um, like the Book of Revelation, like I think most, uh, well, I don't want to categorize, but uh, uh, apocalyptic for sure. It's extremely dualistic. 
text like the like the Apocrypha of John Cicarelli shows very dualistic. Okay, so so they're they're hitting their bad guys differently. <laughs> okay, but you still have um, that going on. So that's so that's one thing. The similarities. Second point is what's at stake in the differences. Well, I think one of the one of the things that, that works well about the secret revelation of John is it lets one see that um, people are not always responsible for bad things that happen to them. You know that sometimes you know the sin lies with somebody else and not with you. Um, sometimes you know there's that there's it allows us a framework to understand structural evil and social evil and injustice is evil as out there for which original sin is not a sufficient answer. You know, the individual morality is not an individual, is not a sufficient answer. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it, you know, I think someone like Irenaeus gives a much more poignant notion about, uh, about the incarnation, you know, and about things like being able to see God in each other and, and simple. So there, there are balances. And, and so that's why I think you go for the critique, but you also go for what you get. What is, what is, what is each text having to offer? And finally, is there any good solution? There's only one, really. <laughs> okay, this is my favorite text. It's called Thunder Perfect Mind. <clears throat> okay, I, I won't read the whole thing. It's a little bit long. Okay, but I'll, I'll read enough of it so you get the point. Okay. I was sent forth from the power. By the way. Um, it's a, this is a big secret, okay? But I think that this text is actually a collection of oracles by a woman prophet. So you have to sort of turn the lights low, and you have to, okay, imagine that I'm in a trance, okay? Okay. I was sent forth from the power, and I have come to those who reflect upon me, and I have been found among those who seek me. Look upon me, you who reflect upon me. You hearers, hear me. You are waiting for me. Take me to yourselves. And do not banish me from your sight. And do not make your voice hate me or your hearing. Do not be ignorant of me anywhere or any time. Be on your guard. Do not be ignorant of me. For I am the first and the last. I am the honored one and the scorned one. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter, and I am the members of my mother. I am the barren one, and many are my children. I am she whose wedding is multiple, but I have not taken a husband. I am the midwife, and she who does not bear. I am the solace of my labor pains. I am the bride and the bridegroom, and it is my husband who begot me. I am the mother of my father, and the sister of my husband, and he is my offspring. I am the slave of the one who prepared me, but I am the ruler of my offspring. It is he is the one who begot me before time on a birthday. And he's my, um, he's my offspring in due time, and my power is from him. I am the staff of his power in youth. He is the rod of my old age. I am the silence that is incomprehensible and the idea whose remembrance is frequent. Why do you hate me, you who love me, and hate those who love me? You who deny me, confess me, and you who confess me, deny me. For I am knowledge and ignorance. I am shame and boldness. I am shameless and I am ashamed. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and peace. I am the one who is disgraced and greatly exalted. Give heed to my poverty and wealth. And don't be arrogant because I am discarded and cast out on the earth. And don't look upon me on the dung heap, nor go and leave me discarded, because you will find me in the kingdoms. Ah. Why have you hated me, you Greeks? Because I'm a barbarian among barbarians. I am the wisdom of the Greek and the knowledge of the barbarians, and I am the judgment of Greeks and barbarians. I'm the one who has been hated everywhere and loved everywhere. I am the one whom they call life, you call death. I am the one they call law, you call lawlessness, and so on and so forth. One of my favorite lines from this is she said, come forward to childhood 
and don't neglect it because it is small and little. Anyway, the text goes on and on in this kind of vein. Um, and uh, I've never been able to write about it because I always just want to say, wasn't that great? <laughs> but it seems to me that, that this is the text that, that, uh, that is refusing these kind of, a, 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 of apocalyptic and, if you will, Gnostic sorts of dualisms. And she ends by saying that she is the divine. You know, so it's an affirmation you know, of, of everything in the divine. And you notice how you know, it's, it's, uh, it's I am the mother of my father. You know? How many of us will end up parenting our parents? You know? yeah, I'm the child, birthing child. And so often when I've taken this text on the road, I'll ask people, um, okay, you write yours. I am. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how people just start writing, you know. Um, I am the drug addict and I am pure, you know. I am the mother who's lost her children and I will never bear to lose them. I mean, it's just it, this, this sort of it, this affirmation that all parts, it isn't that you cease to be a child now, you're an adult, you know. Um, but you're always the child, the adult. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, this, it's this affirmation that is uh, incredibly inclusive. And somehow I wonder... If uh, if notions about theodicy might start in some place, such a place where it would go, you know, where one would get with notions about justice. Mm-hmm. Can take, uh, especially the woman back, so I'm trying to get in and okay. one. So maybe just a couple. Okay, more. two two. More. Then I'll let that'll let everybody go. Sorry. We'll just do two more, and then we'll we'll go. Yeah. Uh, lesson number one is there's already a lot of heresy going on out there. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't ever anticipate that I'll have like a the- systematic theology. You know, you know, uh, part of the attraction I think is to the stories and to retelling the story. You know, the, the way Kierkegaard does. You know, with Abraham's. Abraham and Isaac, you know, he retells that story, he retells that story. And the more often he tells it, the more you think you understand it, but you understand it less. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think these are resources to think with. And again, as I said, I think that learning to think critically out of these materials is the, is the thing. Um, but the other side of it is that often when I do these things in um, kinds of presentations, not like this, but, you know, a particular tax or whatever in churches, um, People come up to me and they, what they say is, I feel like I've been given permission to ask questions. You know, um, and l- like I said, there's a lot of heresy going on out there. Um, and part of it is this question too that if you look at these texts and read them, um, some of these positions, heretical positions, really were rejected from the tradition, and the, the notion that uh, that an arrogant, jealous ignorant, sinful God created the world is one that is not in the tradition. I mean, it's just not, it's not a Christian notion, okay? But many of the other texts, you know, for example, the, the centrality of Jesus' teachings for salvation um, over against his crucifixion and resurrection, which don't, have, which don't play a role, um, really let one see, I think, yet again, the way in which multiple voices have been, have remain in the tradition, you know, um, the death and resurrection of Jesus were interpreted in many, many ways, of which atonement is only one. You know, uh, the relationship to Christianity and Judaism was worked out in many ways, of which supersession was only one. You know, so again, I think that those that there are multiple things there, and some of what these texts could help one do is to see them and sort of pull them up and look at them. You know, uh, wisdom Christologies, the presence of, of Sophia literature. There's a lot of this stuff that's, that's there already um, that then one can, can rethink in a context already uh, within canonical or traditional kinds of, of, of frameworks.
talk about how having cancer surgery has really caused you to rethink your own project and how we think about the body. And I, um, I think that statement has such a gravity uh, and seriousness that it kind of it, it is almost paralyzing um, for us as hearers. To, it seems so obviously true. Um, and then what? So I would love to hear you um, think a little bit with us about what you mean when you say that. Is, is, does that mean that you are rethinking the literature about the constructive nature of physical experience? Does it mean what? what? Well, I don't think, are we yeah, I don't, I don't know in every way. Uh, what it will mean and what it does mean. I think there's I think I have a lot of processing to do. Um, and part of the reason I say it, I think, is because uh, it's a personal thing for me that this has been a big part of my experience in the last six months. And to somehow be present anywhere and have it not be present feels like I'm being dissed. Do you know what I mean? I mean, on the one hand, it's a very private, personal thing, and so... I feel odd saying it, like, oh, I have cancer. On the other hand, um, had <coughs> cancer, but, you know, um, on the other hand, you know, um, to not say it also seems not true. And for me, part of it is that um, I was raised with a kind of, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, some of you may know I'm from Montana. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, with the most beautiful state in the West. Anyway, um, but there's a very cowboy ethic there. You know, and there's a part of like show no vulnerability. Hmm. You know, and there's something about about this business that's about vulnerability in a fundamental kind of way that I need to grapple with, um, and that I need to to embody or live out or talk about. Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't know yet, but you know, it's like uh, including things like surgical reports, and you know. Hmm. That's, that's already like, what are they talking about? And why, what does the absence of the body in Christian theology really mean when we're talking about the body all the time? And it just doesn't strike me that the body's really there. What will it take for it to be there? Um, bodies, people's bodies, our bodies. As somebody who's lived in their head a long time, somehow you have to be really sick to realize, you know, to spend some time with your body. Uh, not a very particularly pleasant time with my body, <laughs> but boy, I was there. Do you, do you know what I mean? And that was that was very interesting. I don't know what it means, except you should all pay much more attention to your health than you have. Anybody who smokes should stop this second, okay? And you should all. Quit getting stressed out. <laughs> you should enjoy your friends and the people around you a lot more. Because when push comes to shove, the things that are important to you are going to be the life that you loved, the people you loved, and the things you loved and enjoyed. Thank you again, Karen.